it here. All right, I am here with Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, Michael Heiser is a uh, Old Testament scholar. I'm going to read uh, part of his credentials here off of one of his older books. Um, he's a specialist in the fields of biblical studies and ancient Near East studies. He has worked for Faith Life, uh, famous for putting out the uh, Bible software uh, Logos. He has an MA in Hebrew studies, a PhD in Hebrew uh, Bible and Semitic studies from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Has published uh, widely in uh, scholarly journals, written several books. I'm, I'm holding up two. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, this is both a podcast and a, a video. Um, this is the one that I think made you maybe most well-known called The Unseen Realm. I'm blocking some of that. And I want to talk a yeah. little bit about that book. Um, the one I would like to focus on is this. Is this your most recent book on demons? Um, yeah, that's the most recent one. The most recent. And I uh, have been diving into this. Y you know what motivated me to dive into demons is because my 13-year-old daughter has had a fascination with the Nephilim and giants in the Bible. No, I... <laughs> My my wife is really concerned. She's like, I don't know, is this okay? <laughs> like she wants to just keep talking about these Nephilim and she's doing all this study and she has notes. She's looking at passages and she saw this book and and saw that you talk about the Nephilim. And I'm like, it might be a little more academic than you're looking for, uh, sweetie, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it. And maybe we can have a yeah. dialogue about it. Michael, thank you so much for being on uh, Theology in the Raw. Yeah, thanks for having me. So the Unseen Realm, when I... So, and I told you this over email that, you know, I've done a lot of study in early Judaism. That was part of my PhD um, and, and old Testament studies. I, it was, it was actually in new Testament, but with a lot of, I mean, it was almost mostly early Judaism with a lot of old Testament background leading up to the new mm -hmm. Testament. So when you started talking about things like the divine council, you know, uh, that Satan in Job one might not be Satan as we assume, you know, it might just be one of the divine hosts, uh, uh, you know, an adversary. And, and it's just, to me, I didn't find it that controversial just because I had already kind of worked through some of that in, in my PhD sure. studies. And I didn't, in a sense, you know, when you, when you're, when you're doing academic study outside of kind of a, a denominational pressure or Christian subculture, you just kind of read the Bible and it's like, Oh, this is what it says. But apparently the, the, and what would you, yeah, you're laughing. Apparently um, some of these things are controversial. So could, could you um, maybe just give a really quick summary of what, you, what are some main things you talk about in un the unseen realm and maybe some of the controversy that that is stirred up or some of the, you know, yeah, we'll yeah. just leave it at controversy. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to do this with, with some brevity. Um, it's a challenge though. Yes. Um, you know, in, in unseen realm, I, I'm I'm really trying. I'm trying to do several things. You know, it, it, the book begins where I I tell people about sort of my own watershed event in, in Grad, Wisconsin. Eight minutes before church, and I had a friend who was there in church with me, um, who had his Hebrew Bible with him, and I, I don't know what we were talking about, but the way the conversation ended was life changing for me, mm. and you know. Again, I can't remember what the context was, but he hands me his Hebrew Bible and says, you know, you, you need to take a look at Psalm 82 in Hebrew. And, I mean, I wasn't a newbie. I mean, I had two master's degrees. I had taught for five years. I taught 20 different courses. I'm in a doctoral program, you know, in a really good, you know, Semitics program. And I had never done it, you know, and I, and I read that and, it, you know, Elohim Nitzav Ba'adat El, you know, God, capital G, because Nitzav is a singular part of simple. There's only, there's only one Elohim there, you know, takes his stand or stands in the divine council. And then the next line is Bekerav Elohim Yishpot, in the midst of the Elohim, in the midst of the gods, he passes judgment. And obviously it's not about a trinity because if you keep reading Psalm 82, they're corrupt. You know, the other Elohim are, are bad, you know, they're they're, they're either inept or incompetent or, you know, bad or all that, you know, all that rolled into one. And I looked at that and I thought, boy, that looks like a pantheon. Hmm. God, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, judging a bunch of other gods. And it sure doesn't sound like idols because, you know, if you, if you take that, you know, you keep reading, you get to verse six where the speaker who's God 
says to this group, you know, I said to all of you, you know, plural pronoun, you are gods, Elohim, sons of the most high, hmm. plural. And again, idols aren't sons of the most high. You know, but you're going to die like men. And then you go over to Psalm 89, you get the same council language, you get the same sons of God terminology, and they're the councils in the skies. And, you know, I was just, I was lost. Like, mm-hmm. like what, what am I going to do with this? And, but fortunately, providentially, I had a, another thought, and that was, I bet Jesus knew this verse. Hmm. I bet Paul knew it. I bet other New Testament writers knew it. And somehow, the theology that they articulate with clarity about the uniqueness of the God of Israel mm-hmm. and the deity of Jesus, that somehow this passage doesn't overturn that. It, like, There's got to be some way where this fits together mm-hmm. and makes sense, but I didn't know what that was. And so I was, I couldn't, you know, I mean, God knew how to, you know, the Lord knew how to push my buttons because it, <laughs> I couldn't let it go. You know, eventually it became a focus of my dissertation. You know, I, I saw that it needed to be married to the two powers in heaven idea that Siegel mm-hmm. was correct, that, hey, yeah. the Jews got this from somewhere. And then he has two sentences about where he, they might have gotten it <laughs> uh, in his in his really important book, Two Powers in Heaven, which was yeah. by that time, that was 1977. So that's like yeah. really old. But I again, had never never encountered it because I had my experience was like you. You know, when you get to the doctor level, they don't, they're not letting you read in translation. Right. Yeah. You know, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to have to read the text in context, the way that the ancient writers thought about it and the way they articulated it, what they meant, you know, what their audiences thought when they were reading this. You know, we're, we're, we're done, you know, filtering it to you through whatever tradition it is that you like. Yeah. That's over. <laughs> it's a wild, wild west, and, man, once you get it that way. Yeah. It, and, and that was, you know, it was a wonderful experience because when, when, you know, I had to work through the, the there's a fear, you know, yeah. involved in this where, and again, this is going to sound goofy, but it's like, if I like really decide to read the Bible the way an ancient writer wrote it and the way that his readers, because he's writing it to an audience, this is intentional, it's not random, you know, like I'm just going to scramble some words down and a thousand years from now, they'll figure out what this means, you know. It, it doesn't work like no communication works like that. So, but if I if I go down this rabbit hole, if I take the red pill here, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know where I'm I'm going to land, and I'll probably lose friends. I'll probably be ineligible for jobs. You know, like like, you know, what church is going to want me? I mean, it, it you, you go all these things go through your mind, and it's like I couldn't let it go. Hmm. I couldn't let it go, and, and and once you cross the Rubicon, there, you know, once I did. The, the scriptures, again, I'm a doctoral student, but the, the scriptures just opened up. Hmm. And so like like when I talk about Unseen Realm and, and when we were putting the book out, I originally put out the first manuscript online because I figured no one would publish it. <laughs> it would just be too shocking, you know, for like an evangelical, you know, an audience that took scripture seriously. They, they, this, they, just, they won't be able to, to deal with this. But eventually, you know, one circumstance led to another where, where Lexham was formed. And then two years later, they found out about this manuscript. And then the rest is sort of history. Mm-hmm. But it, it was scary. But the scriptures have, have opened up to me in, in ways that I could never have imagined. And it really was like reading my Bible again for the first time mm. as a can, doctoral student. Can, can you unpack maybe for an audience that might not understand quite what the what is the controversy here? I mean, yeah. Um, and so yeah, maybe, maybe just to explain it to somebody that yeah. hasn't quite in followed. Psalm 82, you know, you, you, what, what, you know, when I, when I had my, when I was confronted with the text, <laughs> okay, <laughs> when, when, when God said, grab me and grab me by the neck and look at that, you know, just when you're confronted by the text in that particular passage, and I said, it looks like a pantheon, we're taught to not see what is, what the text actually says. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, it's the Trinity. Oh, it, it, these aren't really gods. They're, they're idols or they're Jewish mm-hmm. elders or, you know, whatever, you know, and anything but what the text actually says. Yeah. And the reason we're taught that is because we are so reflexively used to when we see the letters G, yeah. O, and D on a piece of paper or on a screen, our brain defaults to, oh, the letters G, O, and D 
mean a specific set of unique attributes. That's what that means. So, so we can't put an S on the end of it. That just creeps us out. Mm-hmm. And it creeped me out too, because that's the way I was taught to think about G, O, and D. Okay. Well, the biblical writers don't use Elohim in that verse and in, in other passages with a with the idea that the term the term itself means a specific set of unique attributes. And and again, we, we know that because if you actually look up where all the places where Elohim occurs, it's a few thousand, but it's you know there's a payoff to it. If you actually do that, you'll discover that you know there's there's like five or six other things in the Hebrew Bible that are called Elohim mm-hmm. that are not the God of Israel. Right. You got the gods of the nations. You got the disembodied dead in First Samuel 28. You've got the Shadim, you know, in, in Deuteronomy 32. I mean, you know, you have this passage where you have sons of the Most High who are getting judged for being corrupt. I mean, you you have this, so that alone should tell you that Elohim does not refer to a unique set of attributes. Mm -hmm. And that's important because that undermines the the liberal critical view of an evolution from polytheism to monotheism. It undermines that as well, because they're operating from the same assumption. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, eventually I, again, providentially, I, I, you know, I, I come to terms with what this is. I mean, it dawns on me at some point where, you know, all that this really is, is Elohim is a term you would use if you were describing a member of the spiritual world who by nature is disembodied. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all it is. It's like it's a word like spirits. It just tells you, okay, this is what the thing is, and this is where it lives. It lives over in the spiritual world. It's not the human world. It's the spiritual world. Okay, this, this is what you would call it. It's one of the things you would call it to label it. Yeah. And, and that means that Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is an Elohim among lots of Elohim, but only one of those Elohim is him. Right. He is distinguished by biblical writers by virtue of the ways he gets talked about in lots of other passages, mm-hmm. certain attributes that are specifically denied to all other Elohim. Hmm. So it's so almost it's like it's not it, polytheism in Psalm 82, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and this plays out in other passages, you know, like Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, you know, which is where we get the gods of the nations, if we're reading it with the Dead Sea Scrolls anyway, and, and the Septuagint. Um, but again, there, there's a there's an example where our English translations prevent us from seeing what the oldest form of the text actually is. Now, ESV has adopted it and, and LT has, I mean, a few others, you know, yeah. they They've seen the light of day that maybe we ought to put this in because, A, it makes sense, and, B, it's the oldest text we have, you know? Right. So you, you run into these things, but but the, the book has been controversial for what I, you know, I start with Psalm 82 to explain why I'm even writing the book, like what, what rattled my cage. But the whole notion of a God having a prior heavenly family that he that scripture uses family metaphors to describe the relationship and it also describes ruling and partnership metaphors with this group that language is also used of humanity from the very beginning hmm. okay genesis 126 the plurality there is a divine council scene god the singular creator is speaking to the heavenly host and i talk about in the book why it's not the trinity well there's a, there's a controversial point Talk about why that doesn't work, why they wouldn't have been thinking in those terms. But, you know, what Unseen Realm really does is it says, look, unlike Mike, who had one clock hour, not not credit hour, clock hour, 60 minutes of angelology in (laughs) seminary and Bible college and grad school. Unlike that situation, this is really important. Hmm. Because the way God thinks about this family maps over to the way he thinks about his human family. Mm. And that's intentional. Mm. There's a connection relationship between these two families, these two things, and God as the common creator and common father of them. Mm. And what God wants with this new creature called humans that are embodied now, a new kind of creation And there's a reason why this relationship, even when it goes bad, even when there's rebellion and a fall, why these two things are constantly sort of bumping into each other through the rest of the meta narrative of Scripture. 
there's a story to be told here. And you can't under you can't understand lots of scenes, passages in the story if you cut yourself off from a supernatural worldview. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and here I'm not a charismatic. I'm not a pen. I don't have these aren't my traditions. Yeah. And, you know, I have lots of friends who are in these traditions that that love the book because yeah. now they have some scriptural roots to right. some of the ideas that they you know that are they they hold, but they've appreciated it. And, and I'm just saying, look, this these two things just are they're symbiotic. And, mm-hmm. I mean, you would know the Dead Sea Scroll material, you know the Hodiot text, you know the Shabbat Shirot. I mean, they they have this heaven on earth sync up thing going on in their heads, angelic glorification of believers. Okay, that the language for all of these things shows up in the New Testament, and we have no framework as evangelicals mm-hmm. to understand any of it because we have cut ourselves off from from this whole perspective of the way we look at the Bible. And so what Unseen Realm tries to do is it tries to create the framework for understanding that. And I also try to, to convince readers that you need – when you read the Old Testament, you need the Israelite living in your head. Mm-hmm. When you read the New Testament, you need the second temple, the first century Jew living in your head. Mm-hmm. The right context for interpreting the Bible is not your context. It's not evangelicalism. It's not Pentecostalism. It's not Catholicism. It's not anything that post dates the biblical period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Zero. Yeah. None of it. <laughs> okay, the right context for interpreting the Bible is the context that produced the thing, that God picked people in these contexts to communicate to their audience. And if we can if we can get them living in our heads, we're going to understand a lot of things that to, that look really strange to us now. Mm-hmm. Or that, you know, our, ch- our churches are filled with people who know lots of data points. They do know, you know, a good amount of Bible, but they have no framework. In, in which to understand these data points. And so they can't see how these things interconnect. Mm-hmm. They can't see the intelligent interconnectivity of yeah. Scripture. Yeah. You know, and, and so I, I'm just trying to kick that can down, <laughs> down the road a little bit, you know, to please consider reading the Bible in this way and focus on the meta narrative and, and, and have this worldview in your head. Don't be a modern. Don't be a post enlightenment believing skeptic, okay? Don't be that person that that you're actually born to be, okay? <laughs> you know, and that that's the hard part because we are modern. We live in a technological society. We're, you know, we we have we we have Christians who are selective believers in supernatural content. Mm-hmm. Oh, I need Jesus. I need God. I need I need the concept of sin to mean something because then salvation means something. You know, these are all spiritual, theological, you know, supernatural contexts. And we need this column, column A, but the stuff in column B, like that First Peter 3 passage, that Genesis 6, stuff, man, that's just, I, I can't deal with that. <laughs> well, surprise, surprise, both columns, both buckets come from the same right. source. When you talk about the divine council, so what? instead of envisioning, you know, a white guy and a beard on a throne just making, you know, decisions, you know, parting the Red Sea and doing this, or even if we can expand it and be more Trinitarian that you got Father, Son, Holy Spirit, kind of, you know, like at the shack or whatever, you know, making these decisions. You're saying, biblic, just biblically, we should envision God, to triune God, with a, a whole council of angelic beings, and when they're deciding to do something, he is conversing almost like a judge, I don't know, with, the, with a jury and an attorney and you have an advocate and an adversary. And it's way more, for lack of better terms, messy <laughs> than we make it out yeah, to be. There's, there's participation and God enjoys participation. You know, all of these all of these are metaphors that the writer the writers are forced to use the language of order and decision making and royalty, especially, you know, the royal court. To talk about what God is up to, and and you know again the meaningful input of his his counselors, his advisors, you know these are these are simple ideas. Do you like order or chaos? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, you know I like order. Well, that's good. You like order because you're smart, right? Yep, yep, yep. Well, is God intelligent too? 
Well, sure. Well, it stands to reason then he'd like some order, okay? And, and so to talk about God, we, we map over the conversation that help us express these things, you know, just order and disorder. We map that, the biblical writers map that onto the spiritual world because they have to. It's not their world. You know, they're, they're, they're given information. They, they use reasonable deduction. They use the language and metaphor. All these things are in play, you know, when it, when it comes to Scripture. And, and when you really get down to it, like I wrote this little book for new believers called What Does God Want? Hmm. What God wants is a family. This is why humans exist. There's no deficiency in God. He just enjoys creating beings like himself to have relationship. And he likes to have those intelligent beings, the ones who are like him, to participate in enjoying what he has made and doing things. Mm -hmm. It's the dad to the kid, you know, the toddler. It's, you know, it, it, it's the, the guy who knows his business really well and he has an apprentice. Well, you know, take a, ha take a whack at it. You know, if you mess it up, we'll fix it and we'll move on from there. You know, yeah. it, it's this kind of relationship. And so I get asked, well, what does God need with a council? You know, he doesn't need a council. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have that need at all. What does he need with a church? <laughs> what does he need with you? He doesn't need any of this stuff, but he likes it. Yeah. He likes participation. So you go to passages like 1 Kings 22. You go to passages like Daniel 7 or Daniel 4, where, where the watcher, the holy one, comes down to Nebuchadnezzar and says, well, I got some bad news. You're going to go insane for a while, so I hope you like eating grass. You know, just <laughs> maybe you want to mix it with a little. <laughs> I mean, it, but he says, this sentence is by decree of the watchers, plural. Yeah. And then three verses later, he says that the sentence is by decree of the most high. Hmm. So it, it gives you both sides of the same coin. I mean, we don't have a bunch of, you know, holy ones in the heavenly host running rogue and, and doing things that, you know, God doesn't want done. But he'll invite participation, say, OK, like with Ahab, it's time for Ahab to die finally. So how do we want to do that? Yeah. And, you know, one spirit steps forward. You know, I always, this is going to date me, but I always think of Arnold Horshack, you know, in, in Welcome Back, Cotter. Oh, oh, you know, in the back of the room, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, okay, what, you know, what's your idea? You know, and, and, and he tells him, you know, well, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. I'll get him to go up to remote Gilead and he'll die. Yeah. And God says, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> I know I have to buy that. I mean, it, but if, if he would have come up with something stupid, God would have just said, I'm going to call on you later. Anybody else? You yeah. know, like, like I, I want good ideas here, not stupid ideas. That, that Pat, that second Kings 22, I forget the verse. Is it verse 20? Yeah. First yeah, Kings 22, 19 through 23. Yeah. Go, mm -hmm. if you're listening or watching, go read that passage with it. Just pretend like you're not a Christian. You never read the Bible. You're just reading <laughs> a text. And what would you envision that? That is a disturb. Well, that, it's disturbing for evangelicals that have a lot of presuppositions and we're all have presuppositions. It's normal. It's part of life. But I think it takes a lot of courage to be open to say, maybe my presuppositions need to be bent around this text rather than bending the text around our presuppositions. I, I want to transition though, to Genesis six, because this is a passage that has intrigued me for years. And, you know, as a scholar in early Judaism, Genesis six is kind of like the John three sixteen of early Judaism. There's few, <laughs> There's few Jewish texts that don't mention this passage. And unlike yeah. many other things in early Judaism, or as we say, early, Ju early Judaisms, um, yeah. this is the one passage that had a kind of a unanimous interpretation. It is. It, it um, is isn't that ironic? No. So can, can you unpack? I want to. Okay. So let's talk about giants and demons and angels having sex with women. Okay. Christ. Unpack the story of Genesis 6 for yeah. us. And what well, happens like, in the aftermath actually, of that? It's actually a good segue in, into the demons book because, you know, I, I like to say about Unseen Realm, and I would say the same thing about demons, that the dirty little secret of Mike's books is that he never had an original thought. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what I do is I take scholarly stuff and try to make it decipherable to people who care and connect dots. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dot connector. Okay. So all the stuff in there you can find in academia. 
Mm-hmm. As, as you, like, I, I'm going to have to steal your Genesis 6 is like John 3.16. <laughs> That's fine. Because <laughs> you're right. It's, it's like this is like one of the few things that like everybody's just towing this line. Yeah. And, and what, what you have here is you have essentially, you know, if you ask a, a, a Christian, a, a, the average Christian, you know, why is the world such a mess? You know, why do we have evil and all this? Chances are you're gonna, they're going to say, oh, it's the fall. You know, don't you read the Bible? You dunderhead. You know, that's the fall. Well, if you ask the same question to a Second Temple Jew, that's not the answer you'd get. The answer you'd get is, well, there's actually three reasons why the world is just like going to hell in a handbasket here. We've got, you know, the problem in Genesis 3, yeah, that, that was like a kickstart. And then we got Genesis 6, and that's, that's really bad news. And then we've got what happens at Babel with the, the disinheritance of the nations and all that. So we got really three reasons. Of course, if you think that way, you think that the Messiah is supposed to fix all three. Mm. Mm. Okay? You're looking for a reversal in all three. But what we're trained to do is we don't you know, we deny the second one. The third one we never find because we're again we're not reading the text with, with Qumran in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. So we, we we're we're like one out of three pegs here. But when it came to Genesis 6, everybody in in you know the second temple traditions, they saw this as not so much a problem because of the Nephilim stuff. Okay, yeah, you know, we, we get that. And as I talk about in the Demons book, I go into more detail about what the Mesopotamian backstory mm-hmm. to that is with the Apkalu, which, you know, I, I'm I'm just standing on the shoulders of, of the work of somebody like Amar Anus in, in Helsinki, yeah. who, you know, recollated, you know, all that Mesopotamian material and asked the question, hey, all this flood stuff that's, that's in common and everybody knows about it. Does it talk about like the first four verses here specifically? You know, can we look for that? And so he did, and, and everything maps over, which is the neat thing. So there's a backstory here that Genesis 6, 1 through 4, the writer there is shooting at Mesopotamian theology in some very specific ways. And what happens is, yeah, we've got this giant problem, okay, because we've got the sons of God. You know, the cohabitation language is typically the way everybody understood this. I talk about an unseen realm that there's – there's sort of a mythic way to, to honor the supernatural trajectory here, and that is to, to read it like you would be reading about Abraham and Sarah, where there's no, you know, God doesn't do anything sexually with Sarah, but nevertheless, he does something that a population emerges out of this, this woman. You know, maybe that's what we have. I, I don't really care. But what I care about is that we read it with the ancients, that there's a transgression of heaven and earth here. It produces a very specific enemy that when you get to the conquest, all of the other people groups around the, the Anakim who are said to have come from the Nephilim in Numbers 13, 32, and 33, it's not just them. It's all of these other terms linked back into Hittite, Hurrian, and Amorite traditions that all involve giants and a flood. Okay, I don't, I don't do that in Unseen Realm, but, but that's, that is the case. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're drawing on this tradition in Second Temple Judaism. They know this. And so we've got a serious problem here. But there are, this problem, the giants, are eliminated by, catch the list, Moses, Joshua, and David. Mm. What do all those three guys have in common? They're types of the Messiah. Mm. Okay, that, that's not a coincidence. And so the earthly problem, this, this lineage problem that, that provides a lethal element, and, and I, I believe this is the element that's actually targeted with the Perem passages and the, and the killing and destruction. I don't think they're random and wanton. This needs to be eliminated, and it, and it gets, the job gets done by the time of David. But the worst part is all the Second Temple Jews have this tradition that the watchers, the angels that come down, teach humans certain things to steer them toward idolatry and self-destruction. So we have human weakness in Genesis 3. We have human fallibility and human accountability for the fall. But the proliferation of evil is something that there's a supernatural ingredient to. This is why when we go to Genesis 6, we get the weird stuff in the first four verses. And then we get verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every thought of the imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Mm. Well, how do you get verse 5 out of the first four verses? Mm. If you know the backstory, the Mesopotamian backstory, again, you, you, you know the answer to that question. Yeah. And in Second Temple Judaism, they did, because they dip into that material. 
they know the whole they know the whole <clears throat> framework here. And so Genesis six becomes the catalyst for depravity. Hmm. It becomes a, a means by which supernatural beings that want their own imagers, that want their own peoples to rival Yahweh, that that essentially see how one of their own kind was treated after the, the first rebellion, how Yahweh is only interested in redeeming humans. And he condemns one of our brethren, okay? I mean, this is a factor. You get different Enochic traditions about what the motivation was. And this is one of these threads. But where it leads is that you have a situation where humans are now going to be taught weapons, you know, arts of warfare and bloodshed and seduction and idolatry and astrology. All of these things are listed in, in a book like you know, Enoch, which expands the story, but all those things actually are referenced in the Mesopotamian content. Again, that's not a coincidence either. So all of these things produce catalysts to drive people away from a relationship with the true God and toward self-destruction. Instead of healing what happened in Genesis 3, now we've made the problem worse. And it's going to get worse, too, when you, by the time you get to the Babel situation, but this was about depravity mm. in Genesis 6. That was the thing that's the constant touch point, like Miriam Brand and her dissertation that's now published on the origin of evil, you know, Second Temple Judaism. You know, she says, yeah, there were people who, who looked at Genesis 3 and said, you know, humanity has to bear some of the blame here. But, but overwhelmingly, it's that we were taught to destroy ourselves mm. and, and to be adversaries of the true God and, and go off and worship other gods mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and essentially do things that really just lend themselves to our own ruination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were taught to do that. This was a catalyst, catalytic event to make the whole thing worse. And so that's why it was a serious problem yeah. and a consistent touch point. So you know, in the second temple period. I have a question about the so the so sons of God, angelic beings have sex with women and Yeah, if you're asking me how it works, I have no idea. Well, no, no, my question is so you have Nephilim, which are the giant offspring of this union. Um and I don't yeah. I don't know the DNA or biology of all that. How come Nephilim show up and then in numbers thirty three if they've been wiped out by the flood? Was there Yeah. Yeah. You actually have you, have you have a little bit more than three, but you got three major approaches to this. You know, and I, I outlined them in Unseen Realm because this was an old question. You know, you, you'll find these the answers that I'm going to give you emerge out of you know more ancient texts. And one was, well, Noah, somebody in Noah's family was, for lack of a, I'll use a modern word, a carrier. Hmm. Okay, Noah was righteous in his generation. It's not toledot, the genealogical word. It's door, you know, like his time period. Okay, yeah. and you know we have to admit that door is used in one passage for genealogy, so you know I'm aware of that. But you know this was one of the views that that Noah, there was something wrong with Noah and his family because you have other, you have later texts in the second temple period that have Noah as a giant. You've got a, you know the Genesis Apocryphon where Noah's, you know, parents are arguing, like, you know, Noah's dad says to his mom, hey, are you, you sure that's my kid? You know, and she's like, oh, it's not the Watchers. Don't you remember the other night when, you know, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> you know? So, you, you know, you, you get texts like this that show you they're thinking about it. So that's one option. The other option is you have a regional flood, you know, not a global. Uh, by that, and unseen a little bit. And then the question is, if you go to this is 6, in verse 4, where it says, <clears throat> And there were Nephilim upon the earth, you know, in those days, okay, and also after uh, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men. Now, if you look, I mean, Gesenius actually comments on this, that you take that particle combination followed by an imperfect verb form, which is what you have in Genesis 6-4, and it can mean a continuative activity. In other words, what happened here happened afterwards as well. So there, there were some that thought, okay, maybe this is what is going on. But, but this is a very old question. Um, you know, I, I don't really, you know, my, I view my job in Unseen Realm as sort of telling people, well, here's, here are the buckets, you know, be warmed and filled, pick the one you like or, you know, whatever. Um, 
there there are reasons why I kind of like the regional flood idea, but that plays into the sea people and the terminology with other people groups that share the same tradition. So I don't know that that's the case, but yeah. you know, to me, that's that's the most attractive of the three trajectories right and, now. And also, it's not just numbers thir- thirteen, but as you show, oh, yeah. is, is it Deuteronomy yeah. two, Deuteronomy three, and then um, Chronicles Amos has passed. There's giants. I don't want to say everywhere, but there's several passages that talk yeah. about giants. So are we to say that literally there were? Well, two questions. One, so we should assume that we've transported ourselves back in the Old Testament time period and throughout times there are people in faith are facing giants. And if so, how big are these giants? Are they yeah, I, a Goliath sort, yeah, you know, cool. or is it like, you know, I know Enoch says what, like, I don't know how many feet. Oh, Enoch's ridiculous. <laughs> 800 feet taller. I forget, I forget what, it, what they said. Yes. He, he has it at 3000 L's, oh. which is an, an L is a, is another term that could mean cubit, you know, which is just absurd. Okay. okay. Yeah. So what, what I think is going on is, and I base this on on the the two the two people in the giant lineage that are actually measured in the Old Testament. I mean, one doesn't have a name; it's an Egyptian, uh, with which is five cubits, so that's a, that's in the seven foot neighborhood. Goliath, if in the Masoretic text, is six cubits in a span, which is nine feet six inches tall. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, he's four cubits in a span, yeah. which is six foot six. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I view these these individuals as being unusually tall, you know, six foot, upper six foot, maybe seven feet, you know, that kind of thing, kind of like today. Okay. Um, and that makes sense because based on skeletal remains, at least from 1000 BC onward, you know, because we don't, you know, linen and balm. So it's not like we've got, you know, ancient Israelite mummies or Canaanite mummies and that kind of thing. But the average, you know, the, the best guesses by people who focus in this area are the average Israelite male is probably five, 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 five six, you know, five and a half feet tall. Women are a little shorter. So if you've got a guy who's a trained warrior who's six and a half feet tall and, you know, you're just sort of the, the podunk rabble, you know, from, from Egypt, <laughs> you got a bunch of these people that are that are living, they're scattered throughout the land. I mean, I, I don't think we, we should think of this in terms of a race. I think we should think of this in terms of a scattered population. That you, you, Hill country, there's concentrations. You get some in the Shefala Valley, in the yeah. Conquest, and some of the, some of the major urban centers. But you, you've got these people that they keep running into, and it's like, we're just toast. Hmm. I mean, you, you could see where the 10 spies would come back and say, we're – you know, to quote the Aliens 2 movie, we're just dog meat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, Joshua and Caleb were like, hey, did, like the Red Sea, like did that, that should have told us something, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> did you remember that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I, I don't think we're, we're dealing with something freakish. Okay. You know, here, or, or, or Hollywoodish or cartoonish. Now, now the, I think these are, these are people who are just unusually tall and that's how their, their height is parsed. Okay. Um, you know, based upon the Israelite story. You Would know? you say, though, that they do have a genealogical background that's a combination of spiritual and, and human, like Genesis 6? Or is that the later <clears throat> Anakim, Anakim? Are they just more pure yeah, I, human? And I, I would say, again, I, I'm one who, who says that, that the Bible doesn't teach us anything intentionally scientific. Because if that was the point of the Bible, God made some really terrible choices in authors. <laughs> You know, why would he pick somebody living in the second millennium B.C. to tell us about advanced physics? Like, like God, couldn't you realize that that's just not going to work out really well? You know, oh, God just downloaded all that information and secretly encrypted in a Bible code. Well, that's great. That means everybody who read it, nobody could understand it. Yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> that's, there's the communicative enterprise for you right off the bat. You know, so I, I you know, I, I'm one that, that says this has nothing to do with science. So I think we should resist using scientific language nevertheless. I will say that because all of these groups wind up going back to, you know, Babel is such a big deal. Hmm. You know, Babel and Babylon pop up in the craziest places in in the biblical worldview in all periods. Mm-hmm. So much of this, the, the 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 language group terminology winds up either in Amorite traditions, and we have to realize that Hammurabi was an Amorite. Mm. 
This is the Amorite dynasty of Babylon. Okay, the Amorites, that actually means something to an Israelite. You know, it means lots of chaotic, spooky, spiritual stuff, all right? So we've got Amorites, we've got Hurrians, we've got Anatolians, the Hittites. And they all have these same traditions because they, they, they're culturally mixed to a much greater degree. And, and also prior to Israelite occupation. You know, they, they all use cuneiform, for instance. They all have the same sort of flood stories and all that kind of stuff. Because it goes back to the great chaos enemy Babylon, I would say that they do. there is a spiritual heritage here in, in some fashion. I don't know that we can use the language of DNA because, frankly, how does DNA hmm. – how do you get spirit stuff in DNA anyway? You know, I, I, it just doesn't seem the right way to talk about this kind of thing. But I think in, in view of who these people were and where they came from, when you saw among their ranks somebody unusually tall, the first thing you thought of was the Apkalu, mm. like Gilgamesh, you know, the giant warrior mm. from, from, from the, the, you know, this is, this is who the Babylonian gods raised up to oppose us. Hmm. I mean, there's, there's really just literally no other way you're going to parse this people group and that subset within that people group. You, you're just going to think that out of the gate, mm -hmm. just out of the gate. This is what we're dealing with. They're still around. Hmm. When, you know, like when are these guys going to die off? You know, like, and, and so you go into Canaan or the trans Jordan, why does God lead them up? To the, you know, to the other side of the Jordan. And God tells Moses and Joshua, now leave the Moabites alone, leave the Ammonites alone, because the descendants of Esau, okay, you know, like Isaac's other kid, okay, the descendants of Esau have already eliminated them. They've already dealt with the Zuzim and the Zamzumim and the Amim and all, you know, don't worry about them. You go up to Bashan. Why Bashan? Because that's the, where the last of the Rephaim are. The Amorite kings. These they must be taken care of, and you're going to do it here, and then I'm going to bring you back to the same spot where you didn't believe. Hmm. Okay, when we cross into Canaan, and you will confront the Anakim, who are Rephaim, which that's where these guys are, and they come from the enough. You know, it's this whole thing again. You, this is why I think they're targeted because they they. They do represent, and I think in some sense there is a physical you know, lineage going on here because their own people would have identified in the same way. Mm -hmm. They would have believed that these people descend from the gods in some way, that, and they, they have this, this lineage to them, this, this post-flood up Kalu tradition. So both sides are going to be thinking about these individuals the same way, and they become the thing that has to be targeted and dealt with. Mm. Can you explain yeah, the, the, most, the most lethal threat? Can you explain the family tree of the three terms you use? So Nephilim, Rephaim, and yeah. uh, An Anakim, is that right? Or and what's the relation? Is yeah, Nephilim yeah, the overall the term category? Yeah, Anakim is a term that you'll see in Deuteronomy two and three, and in Numbers thirteen, this is the this is the group where when the spies go in, they bring back the report and they say we saw the Anakim in the land. The sons of Anak is another way they're referred to. Yeah. Um, and it says explicitly that they come from the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. So Anakim is, is an important term in the, uh, in the Canaan side, you know, Canaan proper. Yeah. On the other side, the Anakim were called Rephaim. Okay. okay. So you, you get this terminological mix. If you read through Deuteronomy 2 and 3, it'll say that the Anakim, you know, are, are Rephaim. And, okay. And it, it, that's where you also get Amorite, you know, referred to. But, mm. but Amos 2 sort of lumps them all together. When Amos talks about the, con, the, the conquest in Amos 2, 9, and 10, he refers to them all as Amorites, you know, tall as cedars and all that kind of stuff. Okay. See, it's kind of interesting. Canaanite and Amorite um, and, and even Hittite, are actually umbrella terms for the, the pre-Israelite occupants of the land. Mm -hmm. And then a subset of them are these, these other guys, okay. you know, uh, like Ezekiel, there's, there's a reason why Ezekiel uh, 16 starts out with, you know, our, <clears throat> our, uh, our father was an Amorite and our mother a Hittite, or I don't know if I have those two reversed, but I mean, there, there's something going on there that's actually significant to an Israelite mind. Yeah. But the, these are the guys, you know, so you get, you get these terms, um, 
used with some geographical concentration, but they do overlap too. Okay. And, and Rephaim is important. I think this is what you're angling for. Because in, in Second Temple Judaism, when you, when you killed one of these, uh -huh. their disembodied spirit is what, what became known as a demon. Mm. Okay? They're, they're, the seeds of this idea are in the Old Testament in passages like Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 32. And there's a couple Psalms where you have the Rephaim and Sheol. Right. Okay, and, and you know they're not handing out party favors. Okay, you know it's just <laughs> you you don't this is a place you don't want to be yeah. to begin with, and now now they're there, and 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 again it, it provides these little kernels, these little data points for linking that term with the biblical material uh -huh. of the giant clans. You know when they were still alive, you know on Earth and all that, and then you know some of these places like Bashan and Ashtaroth and Edrai, which even in Canaanite texts were viewed as gateways to hell, gateways to the underworld. And it's very easy to see how on the other side of that, you could come out with Second Temple Jewish writers saying, okay, they're evil spirits and they live in the underworld and they can come out because the original sons of God offenders, they got locked up in the abyss. You know, they're, they're in chains of gloomy darkness, as Peter says. Mm -hmm. But these guys aren't. So they come out every now and then to harass us and seek re-embodiment. And boy, we hate these guys. You know, it's just, they're, they're bad news. You know, we don't want to be there. We don't want to meet them. They're out to get us and harass us and harm us and possess us. And mm -hmm. you, can, you can see, again, the logic mm -hmm. that, that goes into the association. And in the Demons book, uh, I, I build off a, a dissertation that's now published in the Moore Seebeck series by uh, Clint Wallen. Who did a his dissertation on unclean spirits, the impurity of spirits? Interesting. And he, and he, you know, he asks a really simple question. He says, "Why are they called unclean?" And it's not because they're ugly and they're icky, hmm. okay, like Hollywood. It's because in the Levitical worldview, the fundamental premise of uncleanness was forbidden mixture. And this is what they are: they're the product of forbidden mixture. So, of course, they're unclean. Duh. You know, I mean, but again, to us, we, we have to, I mean, yeah. somebody had to write a dissertation on that. That doesn't, like, <laughs> intuitively occur to us. It's, it's why in, in Qumran they're called bastard spirits. Well, that's what they are. Hmm. Lo and behold, you know, the terminology actually makes sense. You know, so you, you get, what, what I'm trying to get at is here is, the, for us, the worldview is really foreign, and it takes a lot of work to even penetrate why things are talked about the way they are. Mm -hmm. To an Israelite, and again, a literate Israelite, somebody who actually has a Bible, and you know, a Second Temple Jew, a lot of this is just intuitive. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they, they just know this stuff. So you're saying d demons are the spirit that came from, that, co that come from deceased that is, yeah, giants. That is the second temple answer to where do demons come from. Right. Now, now the, the title of the book is deliberate. The book title is Demons, and the subtitle is oh. what the Bible really says about the powers of oh. darkness. I want people to know that not all the powers of darkness are demons. Mm. See, in Christian tradition, black hats are demons, White hats or angels. Right. We're done then. This is why, again, I had one clock hour, <laughs> <laughs> you know, of, of training. And we didn't get into any of this stuff. Uh, you know, it, there's nothing to see here. Right. Let's move on to something interesting and important. You know, like what? Dichotomy and trichotomy. <laughs> you know, I mean, we could spend a week on that. But we can't do any of this. You know, yeah. when it comes to the demons you encounter in the Gospels, the, the, this is what the Jewish thinking is like. I don't know if were you a contempt. Did you have Archie Wright at all? Was he at? I mean, you went to. I went Durham to Aber or? I was at Aberdeen. Aberdeen. Yeah. You went to Aberdeen. Okay. I think Archie went to Durham. Mm. But you know, Archie Wright, who has been teaching at Regent in Virginia, mm. I mean, he more or less wrote the book on this. You know, the origin of evil spirits. I mean, there's other good books, but Archie goes through and. He collects all the material. That was his dissertation and got published by Morrissey back. And mm -hmm. He 
you know, Annette Yoshiko Reed has done some really good stuff here. And I mean, Stukenbrook has done great mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. You know, when you have, again, I don't, it's wonderful because I don't have to do any work. You know, it's just like, yeah. you know, you, you get a few of these dissertations and it's like, okay, that, there it is. But, but, you know, how do we, how do we process the data points? Yeah. Cause there are a lot of unanswered questions, you know, we're like, the, the, the relationships between the Satan figure and, and you know, the who will, again, be capital S Satan in the New Testament. And he also is in, in the intertestamental period as well. But Satan figure and the, the demons and then the, the, the gods of the nations, the fallen gods of the nations, which is actually where Daniel gets his theology from. Hmm. You know, principal, you know the, 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 the princes, the supernatural princes over the nations. Where does Daniel get that? It's, there's there's a good example of a question that we never ask. Okay, like where does Daniel get that? Is he sitting there one day in Babylon thinking, man, I, I got to finish chapter ten, but I don't know what to say. You know, I, let's just make something up. <laughs> and that looks good. Nobody will notice. And I can move on <laughs> to chapter eleven. You know, no, it, it, he gets his theology from the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. That, that the gods of the nations were assigned to those nations, allotted to them in, in a punishment by, by the Most High, which is a situation that goes terribly wrong. And we know, you know from Psalm 82, they're getting judged for sowing chaos among the nations and injustice and all this stuff. You know, basically, they turn, all, they turn their charge, each of them, into an anti-Eden and, and, and accept worship you know, for themselves and, and seduce the Israelites to worshiping them as well. I mean, it, it just goes very badly, but that's a third group. Mm-hmm. So it's this group that, that's over the nations. This is where Daniel gets his theology that somehow geopolitical, you know, turf and empires are somehow linked to supernatural powers. You know, and it's obvious that humans, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is just a guy, he's a king, he's a tyrant. But connected to what he's doing is a supernatural intelligence that influences his thinking. Okay, I mean, this whole notion of, of cosmic geography, as scholars like to refer to it. Well, that's where Paul Paul gets his theology of the principalities and powers. I mean, he does use the word demon occasionally mm-hmm. in 1 Corinthians 10, you know, 21 and 22, and, and he's he's alluding to Deuteronomy 32, which tells us again that the gods Paul considered the gods to be real entities, the Shadim, right. who are Elohim in Deuteronomy 32:17. So he, he does refer to them as, as demons, and that's usually a Septuagint thing, you know, because the Septuagint kind of levels the terminology. But in these cases, he uses rulers, thrones, principalities, powers, dominions, you know, all this kind of language. And what do all these terms have in common? They're terms of geographical rulership. And in Paul's head, he's the perfect guy to use this language. I mean, you, why would he be thinking of it? Well, he's the, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Hmm. It's his job to take the gospel to all these disinherited regions and preach to them. And God is going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant that says it's through you know, the seed of Abraham, Jesus, the Messiah, that these nations are going to be blessed. I mean, you know, God is he is out to get people from everywhere. It's not just Israel. Mm-hmm. And this is this is the stuff that that I think, you know, I like Bible stuff. I like biblical theology. OK, I, but what I really hope people take away from the demons book. Is I, I hope they are alerted to and arrested by Paul's connection. Between the resurrection and ascension and really the kingdom of God. With the nullification of the authority of the rulers and principalities and powers. Paul connects those two ideas when he talks about the resurrection. And he, and more specifically, he connects it to the fullness of the Gentiles, which is the fulfillment of his job in the context of the Great Commission. So in, in other words, when I get asked what spiritual warfare is, my answer is really simple. It's the Great Commission. You have to ask yourself, what do the powers fear? What don't they want to happen? Hmm. I'll tell you what they don't want to happen. They don't want the fullness of the Gentiles to happen. Wow. Because as Paul says, when that happens, Israel will have its awakening, you know, whatever all Israel means, okay? Mm-hmm. But that the fullness of the Gentiles is a catalyst to the awakening of Israel, and then the end will come. This is when the sentence passed in Psalm 82 is going to be carried out. Mm-hmm. They're done. 
they're destroyed. They're not just nullified in, in the authority they have. That's been withdrawn. As soon as Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, okay, we're done with that. They have no authority over the people living in these places. You know, the Lord says, go get them. I mean, you have the authority now. The Great Commission, the, the verse we all miss, verse 18. It's not just Matthew 28, 19, and 20. There's verse 18. Okay, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Yeah. Okay, well, who, you know, who, why is that new? It's because by God's own judgment, the Gentile nations had been under dominion of other gods. We're done with that. Huh. You know, I, I wish we had time. I, I, I could tell you a great story about me going on a pagan podcast. Oh, yeah. Where, where this, I'll, 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 I'll give you the short version. So I, I get an email one day, and it's, it's signed by Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, okay, Hercules sent me an email, so I should probably reply to this <laughs> one. You know? <clears throat> so I, I, I emailed this guy back. And he, you know, we, we got into a, a conversation and he said, look, he said, I'm going to be up front with you because I'm a pagan. He goes, I, I worship the gods of Greece and Rome. And I just read your little book, Supernatural. He goes, I loved it. He goes, I, I finally found somebody that will know what I'm talking about when, when we talk about the gods. Hmm. He goes, will you come on my podcast? And I'm like, oh, sure, this sounds like, like it'd be fun. You know, why not? You know? So I go on this guy's podcast, and, and no lie, I mean, the audio is terrible. You know, it's unfortunate. But for the first, I don't know, five, ten minutes, it's this guy going through all these Greco-Roman texts that describe the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Huh. Why we worship the gods we do because they're allotted to us. And the bigger god said you do this and that. And, you know, I have a passage from Plato in the Demons book that, that illustrates this hmm. point. They even use allotment language. It's, it's just remarkable. Hmm. But but what it what it it did for me is like okay, you know I had this moment of, of this epiphany like right on this guy's show, and, and I'm listening to this and I'm I'm like this is awesome. I mean even if even if I I mess this interview up, I mean this was just worth it because I'm I'm like getting all this information. So he goes through all this stuff and and he says I have one question. If the Most High of Israel set this whole thing up what does he want it's like oh i'm so glad you asked you know wow. and so it's like you know the, the rest of it was like okay just just reimagine paul's ministry paul goes into a gentile city and he preaches the gospel and and, and he you know he could have a probably happened every day to paul every day he's got some pagan in front of him he says look i get it i, I get it you know you you guys worship these gods and, and you're thinking, you know, if I believe this Jesus stuff and I realign my loyalty to Jesus, I'm in, I'm in serious trouble. I mean, the gods are going to get me. Hmm. This, I mean, I, they could get my family. You know, who knows if enough people do this in the town, the gods are going to come after us. So it, it was a fearful thing. And, and Paul could look at this guy in the eye and say, look, I understand that completely. Because you know, the Bible, you know, you know, the Most High, you know, did this, but you have to realize that the same Most High became a man and was born of a woman, died on a cross, rose from the dead, and is ascended to his Father, and in doing so, he stripped away the authority of these gods over you. Hmm. So not only are you allowed by the Most High the one who set all this up. Not only are you allowed and authorized to believe in Jesus, but he insists on it. Hmm. So, it, I mean, it, it just, this is a this is a gospel conversation with a pagan gender. I mean, in a sense, their worldview has space for everything you're saying exactly. in a way that's exactly. much, you don't have to say that whole narrative that you've been believing is wrong. Let me give you an alternative one. You introduce exactly. Jesus as the savior, the main point of the narrative that they're embracing. I have had people in, in I mean, you know, I've gone to conferences and done this, and there's a bunch of African pastors sitting in the back, and they're bored to tears. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, we do this every day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but and, and it's the same with, it's the Africans, it's the Hindus. Yeah. Okay, this is one of the reasons why I was motivated, you know, what, I mean, 
I have a nonprofit because one of my listeners called me up one day and said I was stupid for not having one and, and told me he would start it for me. So, OK, go ahead and do that. And it's like when he does it, when, like when he's serious, like, oh, what do we do now? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so we're, we're, we got Supernatural translated into over 20 languages now. But I've had Hindus and you know people from these really polytheistic cultures mm-hmm. tell me that, holy cow. I mean, this, this the conversation just changes instantly. We don't have to tell them that they're silly or they're superstitious or they're idiots. Right. You know, for having this part of their worldview, it's like, yeah, we know all about that. Mm-hmm. You need it, to think about it a little differently. Just as you're talking, so many so many passages are coming to mind, but it made me think like that First Peter three passage, you know, oh, yeah. when Jesus goes and preaches victory over the spirits in prison. Is that the First Peter three one? Um, yeah, that's not just a troubling side note. That's actually integral to this to the stories to the story. It he turns, must go preach victory it over this in, into spiritual warfare. Yeah, it, and, it's, it's, a, it's a gesture of spiritual warfare. You know, it, I that was the only that was the passage. And I think I allude to it in Unseen Realm about we were visiting churches when we moved to Madison and, and a pastor at a church we were visiting literally stood up. They were doing a series on First Peter. We got to this passage. And I'm like all excited. Like, this is going to seal the deal. This is where we're going to go. And he, and he gets up and he says, well, we've been going through First Peter. And today it's First Peter 3, 14 through 22. And I'm just going to be honest with you. This is just so weird. I don't know what to do with it. So we're just going to skip it. Uh, no. Like he, like he said that in the pulpit. And I'm like, I, I can't believe I just heard that. <laughs> You know, and my wife didn't have to ask me if we were going back. So, <laughs> but it, but it's like all you need for the passage. I mean, you look at it, and I'll. I'll I mean, at the time, I thought just try, yeah. just say something, just try. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no, we're gonna bail. But if you look at it, yeah, it looks weird. Why do we get baptism and the ark and Noah and the resurrection? And the spirits in prison. Yeah. You know, it, it's like it's like Peter just like put it all in a blender and hit the button. Wow, <laughs> it comes out. You know, yeah. this will be awesome. But all you really need it's it's actually a fairly simple thing. You know, typology. Okay, a type is a person or an event or an institution that foreshadows something to come. It's a, it's a nonverbal prophecy. We want to put it that way. So as as Paul had you know, used Adam as a type of Jesus, you know, you, you could talk about Adam mm-hmm. to foreshadow something, you know, later about Jesus. So Peter uses Enoch as a type of Jesus in his writing. Mm-hmm. He knows the Enochian version of what happens before the flood, and he knows his audience is familiar with that. So he uses the Enoch story to illustrate something about what Jesus did, hmm. like a foreshadowing. So if you know the story, and, and I mean, in, in the book, I go through, you know, the just the little basics of the Enoch version, how, you know, the watchers who are the sons of God of Genesis 6, you know, they've sinned and, and you know, things are just going you know, terribly with these you know, Nephilim and all this stuff. And God's going to judge everybody. And he, he's, you know, he's holding them, you know, in prison, waiting to announce judgment. And so they get Enoch to go talk to God. Hey, can you can you tell God we're sorry? And boy, we, we shouldn't have done that. You're right. You know, we're it was wicked. And can you just forgive us and let us out? And so Enoch goes and talks to God and he comes back and he goes to the spirits in prison. Mm-hmm. And what does he say? Well, the answer is no. You guys are still gonna be here. So long. <laughs> It's bad news. I mean, they're, they're, they're in prison. They're not getting out. So Peter takes this and he says, now let's think about Jesus. You know, Jesus goes to the spirits in prison. And again, this is, this is me, how I presented in Unseen Realm. You know, Jesus shows up there and it's like, wow, what's the son of God doing here? Maybe we want, he's dead. He's not dead. You know, like, it's a good, you know, even though we're down, here, knock it down, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and so Jesus, you know, is down there in, in the role of Enoch. And I, I, the way I imagine is Jesus saying, yeah, I'm here, but I know something you don't. I'm not going to be here long. Mm. 
I'm going to be out of here in three days and you're still going to be here. So you didn't win anything. You think you did. And so does your master. But that is incorrect. Wow. So yeah, that's where you get the resurrection in there. And, and so Peter says, when you get baptized, when, you know, this whole death, burial, resurrection imagery, okay, when you get baptized, it is not only a confession and a, and a profession to the people watching you, because you, th- this act identifies you as a member of the kingdom of Jesus and, and aligns your, your loyalty with him. It's also a message to them. It's like a reenactment of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection out of the realm of the dead, and they're still there all over again. Hmm. Every believer is a a persistent salt-in-the-wound reminder to Hmm. them that they are the losers in this exchange. Wow. You know, and so that you get the language of conscience, which if you look it up in BDAG, it can be a pledge of loyalty. I mean, this is what baptism is. I mean, it's not if, if you understand the, the, the typology, it's not that hard to, to noodle it. Mm-hmm. But but there's a gap there. Why? Because we're Protestants. We don't talk about Enoch. I mean, we don't talk about that Dead Sea Scroll stuff, or that Second Temple, whatever it is. You know, I mean, we just read the Bible. <laughs> Great. Great, yeah. just like Peter, right? He had no idea what he was doing. You know? <laughs> and then we skip over yeah. passages in the Bible when, when we do. Right. I mean, what, one, you know, I use the analogy of one Enoch. You know, you have people always troubled by the quote in, um, in Jude or whatever. I'm like, look, yeah. one Enoch. Um, I don't think it was inspired by God, but it was as widely read as crazy love and purpose driven life combined today. Oh, and we yeah. quote from yeah. spiritual people inspiring literature all the time. Everybody knew yeah. one Enoch in that day. Everybody knew Enoch, you know, and, and the thing is, okay, you might want to, if, if you're driving and listening to this or watching and you shouldn't be because it's video, <laughs> you might want to pull over the road. I'm going to say something shocking. Take out a pen. <laughs> Biblical writers read books. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. They really did. They were literate. They read books. Yeah. And, and when they were writing, they thought, you know, this is a, I like this book and lots of people read it. And, and I like what it says right here because it really helps me make a point. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to use that to make my point. Like it's not rocket science. Yeah. You know, we don't have to have discussions about should we have Enoch in the canon? Yeah. You know, everybody does this with Enoch, but nobody does it with the bail cycle. <laughs> okay, all these Old Testament passages, they dip into the bail cycle. Where's the discussion about should the bail cycle be in the canon? You know, <laughs> it, it's just because people don't – they don't have – they haven't been taught – I mean, this this is going to sound inflammatory, and I guess I have to do this once in a podcast interview. But <laughs> we have been taught, I think, pretty poorly about how to think about the enterprise of Scripture, like, like how we actually got this thing. You know, even though we deny a dictation theory, we still have this sense – that if it's in the Bible, the content can't appear anywhere else. Mm. It's got to be totally unique. Mm-hmm. It's got to teach modern science. It's got to, you know, you need a, if you have a Ph. degree and, you know, Ph.D. in electrical engineering, you figure out the Bible code, it all just opens up to you. You know, you didn't have to get that degree. It's in the Bible. You know, we, we have these really funky ways of thinking about Scripture where we don't want to affirm God, the Spirit is whispering every word in the ear because when you get to the synoptics, that just works really badly, okay? <laughs> but there's all this other stuff. Look, if you strip the humanity out of Scripture, you undermine its inspiration. Mm-hmm. You just do. That's good. You know, I, I think we, what we really need is to get a better appreciation for a providential view of inspiration, that God was involved with in the lives of these writers from the very moment of you know, the moments they, of their childhood, all the way up through their adulthood, what they knew, what they experienced, you know, what they learned. I mean, all of these things are contributing factors. That, and God maintains an interest in these people because he knows at one, at one point in history, they're going to be at this place at this moment. And they are going to be equipped to do the job. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it doesn't have to be. What we've done is we've turned the Bible into a channeled book. This is what UFO cults do, folks, okay? 
that we've, we've turned the Bible into a channel book and we have stripped out a moment by a moment providential interest and oversight in the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it's really, it makes it vulnerable mm-hmm. to criticism. And we can't process simple things like a biblical writer liked a book that he read and, and thought it would be helpful. Yeah. Like we can't process that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Michael, I, I, I could talk to you for hours. We're over an over an hour here and I'm, uh, I don't want to cut in too much of your time, but, uh, um, I, just, I would highly recommend. Just means I don't have to go to another meeting. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, it, so, I mean, unseen realm sold over a hundred thousand copies. Right. So I, I think, yeah. People, I, a good percentage of my audience is probably at least familiar with it. If you haven't read it yet, I would highly recommend. I, I don't know, demons. I thought. I mean, I have, to, I have this line around the house, and my kids are like, "What? What are you reading?" I'm like, "Oh, this is good stuff. You got to check this out." But I, I highly recommend demons. It's, um, yeah, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. You go into great detail. I mean, what I love about your work is, you know, as an academic who likes to speak broadly to the church, like you do. I mean, you, your your books are. I would say very academic, but they're also very clear too. I mean, it, it helps if you know the languages and you do go, you yeah. know, deep in ways that if someone's not familiar, they might be a, a little lost. But I, I find your books to be very clear for academic work, which is, as you know, is not always, you know, um, the, the know. giftedness of academia. But um, uh, where else can people go find your work? You have a website, right? And uh, yeah, the. The, the nerve center is DR, as in doctor, DRMSH, so, so just DR in my initials, DRMSH.com. You know, it, it's, it takes you to everything else. For the books, you know, just go to Amazon. Everything's yeah. up there. Uh, I, I have a, you know, I have a Fringe Pop uh, 321 YouTube channel where we do, I mean, I've been in the Fringe community for over 20 years. <laughs> so we, we try to do a, a gentle not in, in other words, non-confrontational apologetics response to crazy stuff that you see on the History Channel and the, in the internet and YouTube and stuff like that. So we're about a hundred episodes into that. Okay. Um, you know, the nonprofit gets my anything I have rights to. I, I try to translate to give away for free in other languages. So that's mcclot.org. But you, you know, everything you can find okay. um, is on the website. Naked Bible Podcast. We do one episode a week where we just right. do biblical stuff and we try to, again, do what we're doing here, like try to keep it in its, in its own context. So, yeah. yeah, lots of things going on. Um, School of Theology is new. That's why I left Logos, you know, to hook up with this. So it's a large church that has had a, I'll, I'll put it the way they put it. We, we no longer want to be an entertainment-based church. We want to be a content-producing church. So it's actually a network of churches, about 20,000 people, and very, very mission-minded, mm. very international in its focus. So they asked me if I could go there and help. Mm. So it's like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're up for that. That's Celebration but, Church, is that right? In, yeah. And what city is that in? It's in Jacksonville. Okay, great. Jacksonville, Florida. So they have, they have seven or eight campuses internationally and a few other ones in Florida, and, and one in D.C., Okay. One in Washington, D.C. But it's, again, if, if you've ever wondered what would happen if, if like one of these huge mega church networks all of a sudden decided or, or, or came with, was confronted with the realization that, you know, what we're doing here doesn't look a whole lot like the Great Commission. And mm-hmm. maybe we should be teaching people and mm-hmm. getting people focused on learning scripture and doing our job. Yeah. You know, rather great. than rather than having events, you know. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with. So it's it's been a two year process for them. I've been there since January, um, so it's still a work in progress. But it's it's kind of amazing to see a church just go through that mm-hmm. and and just try to try to do what we're supposed to do. You know, I, I don't really know any. I wish there was a better way to put it, but yeah, that's no, kind yeah. of it. You know? That's good stuff. Thanks so much, Michael, for being on the show. Uh, we'll see you next yeah, time on. Uh, Theology and Raw, if you're listening to the podcast, if you're watching the YouTube channel, please subscribe below and we will see you again.